I would like to welcome everyone who's joining us today for Jubilee Campaign's United Nations Human Rights Council Parallel Event. This event is entitled No One Left Behind, Stemming Child Early Enforced Marriages and Forced Conversions of Minority Women and Girls. The United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime released a report in October 2020 documenting the interlinkage between human trafficking and forced marriages. While the report is extensive, it admitted that the data collected did not include interviews with victims or representatives of different minority groups. We do commend the report to you. This parallel event is convened to complement the report of the UN ODC, as well as the work of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights by highlighting the vulnerabilities of minority women and girls to force conversions and marriages. And our focus today will be on three countries, Egypt, Nigeria, and Pakistan. We have speakers from each of these countries who will be presenting today. In October 2020, 13-year-old Catholic girl Arzo Raja was kidnapped outside of her home in Karachi, Pakistan. Days later, Arzo's parents were informed that their daughter was forcibly converted to Islam and forcibly married to her captor, a 40-year-old neighbor. Arzo's story is just one of the scores of similar cases, not only in Pakistan, but in other nations, as well as other places that occur every single year, and often with impunity towards the abductors. We want to see if we can end the impunity. Jubilee Campaign, alongside with Coptic Solidarity, has on numerous reports we presented that raise the concerning trend of abductions and forced religious conversions of minority girls and women, as well as the links between human traffickers and the facilitation of marriages, which are imposed, forced, and unwanted. Next week, on Monday, the 8th of March, the world will focus on International Women's Day. It's only fitting that we raise this issue and continue to raise the awareness to ensure that girls of today can enjoy their full rights of women tomorrow. In stating this, we note that girls who marry before the age of 15 are 50% more likely to face physical and sexual violence from a partner. And it's our goal to see that, that those numbers are, are reduced significantly. I am Ann Bowalda, the Executive Director of Jubilee Campaign. I will be moderating today's UN Human Rights Council parallel event. We will be recording today's event and anyone who has questions on the right of the, of the panel, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box um, and we, we welcome your questions. We will have a time at the end. Uh, we would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Mrs. Uh, Mama Fatima Singati. Of, she is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Sale and Sexual Exploitation of Children. She is joining us today. We're very pleased to have her. And um, she is a renowned lawyer, politician, and judge with nearly 20 years of experience. The Honorable Singbati currently serves as a consultant on human rights and legal reform. Um, she's held numerous notable roles in the High Court and the Court of Appeals of the country of Gambia, and she's joining us from Gambia. Um, she's formerly served as the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Gambia. Uh, during her work at the Ministry of Justice, Ms. Sangati uh, led the Child's Rights Unit and advocated for the promotion of the rights of girl child, and she's for overseeing the drafting of legislation criminalizing female genital mutilation and child marriage. Uh, these are important initiatives. Ms. Uh, Singati has also served as a project coordinator within the minister, Ministry for the UNICEF Government of the Gambia Country program of cooperation. Clearly, she's very, uh, um, um, uh, very expertise 
in, in, in what she'll be presenting today. And so we would like to uh, welcome uh, and invite her to join us. And thank you for your remarks. You now have the floor. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm happy to be here. Um, I read recently a harrowing news report of a 12-year-old girl from a religious minority who was allegedly kidnapped, forced to marry her abductor, and forcefully converted to another religion. As the special rapporteur on the sale and sexual exploitation of children, I find it very disturbing that any person, let alone a child, can be abducted, forcefully married, and or converted to another religion under duress with impunity. UNICEF estimates that at least 12 million girls are married off before the age of 18 years, which translates to 28 girls per minute. We know that early and forced marriages of children is a violation of human rights. It prevents children from living their lives free from all forms of violence with wide ranging and adverse consequences because child marriage disproportionately affects girls. It compromises a girl's development by resulting to early pregnancy and social isolation, interrupting her schooling and limiting her opportunities for career and vocational advancement. We also know that it occurs for a number of reasons, including gender inequality, poverty, insecurity, and tradition. International legal instruments, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, provide a cornerstone in the fight to highlight child marriage as an abuse of human rights. Yet, the of early and forced child marriage has proven extremely difficult to eradicate since it is a problem that stems from several intersecting socioeconomic and cultural factors and is therefore deeply embedded in some communities. Compounding this problem is a disturbing phenomenon of all conversion of girls from minority groups. Conversion is an absolute right, of course, that any person can freely convert from one religion to another or convert back at any time he or she decides. Any person can also decide not to adopt any religion or belief. But when conversion is made under duress, it becomes a violation of human rights. International law prohibits any form of coercion that would impair the right to have or adopt a religion or belief including the use of threat of physical force or penal sanction to con compel believers or non-believers to adhere to their religious beliefs and congregation, to recant their religion or belief or to convert. This includes policies and practices having the same intention or effect, such as, for example, those restricting access to education, medical care, employment, or other rights. A girl who is a double victim of forced marriage and forced conversion may experience conditions inside the marriage which meet international legal definition of slavery and slavery-like practices, including servile marriage, sexual slavery, child servitude, child trafficking, and forced labor. In the 2009 report of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief to the General Assembly, it was documented that girls were allegedly abducted by members of a different religious community, forced into marriage, and forcefully converted. The special rapporteur then emphasized on the fact that no one should be subject to coercion, which would impair his or her freedom to have or adopt a religion or believe his or her choice, and that the betrothal or marriage of a child shall have no effect. International legal instruments, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the 1981 Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and Discrimination based on religion or belief on this issue are very clear. 
the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion protects without discrimination the right to have or to adopt or to change a religion or belief of one's choice. Unconditional freedom from coercion, the right to manifest one's religion or belief either individually or in a community with others, and parents and guardians to provide a religious and moral education for their children in accordance with their conviction and the evolving capacity of the child. Other than the gross violation of international human rights law, conversion on the duress to any religion not only affects the child psychologically and emotionally, but it also is disruptive to religious harmony and peaceful coexistence within communities, and this fosters violence and unrest. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is one of the most widely ratified international treaty, is very clear on the need to protect children from all forms of physical or mental violence, injury or abuse, neglect or negligent treatment, maltreatment or exploitation, including sexual abuse. The protection of children is everybody's responsibility, especially state parties, to this convention and the protection should be absolute, irrespective of who the child is and what minority group she belongs to. Furthermore, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief in his 2020 report to the General Assembly aptly posited that, and I quote, the people most likely to be left behind by development are often those who endure discrimination and exclusion on the grounds of identity, often multiple identities, including religious or belief identity. Such discrimination can be particularly acute in situations where persons identify with a religion or belief group that is numerically inferior to the rest of the population and or in a non-dominant position in a given society." End quote. This statement could not be stressed more in these circumstances. That is why it is imperative that governments and state parties to the aforementioned international legal instrument enact laws that criminalize forced conversion through forced marriages of children. At this juncture, I would like to thank Jubilee Campaign for organizing this event to shine a light on these horrifying crimes perpetuated against minority women and girls to inter alia help policymakers and others understand the vulnerability religious and ethnic minority women face and in so doing provide recommendations on how to address them. Given, however, the nature of these crimes, legislation alone may not be sufficient to address this problem. Data collection is a necessity to determine the extent of the problem to enable targeted intervention. Raising awareness and education is also key to promote tolerance and tackling discrimination against religious minorities. Again, with reference to the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, his report in 2020 proposes structural indicators to appraise the extent of which legal and institutional frameworks within a state incorporate international human rights obligation and can be indicative of discrimination. He suggests that the process indicators should enable verification of states' effort to operationalize its human rights commitment by way of policies, procedures, and practices, which makes it possible to examine the state's exercise of its duty beyond lawmaking to include, for example, the accessibility and inclusivity of mechanisms for right holders to report violations of human rights, the provision of human rights training to state officials, or government support for relevant non-state actors who have a role in implementing human rights. Protecting freedom of religion or belief and eliminating discrimination in practice, according to the Special Rapporteur, may also require special measures in programming and capacity building to address the specific concerns and needs of individuals and groups who exist at the margins, such as the minority, religious, or belief communities. In light of the above, Madam Chairperson, 
my mandate will reach out to the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Religion and Belief to support advocacy effort to stem child and forced marriages and conversion of minority women and girls. I look forward to a very fruitful deliberation on this very, very important topic. Thank you all for your kind attention. Honorable Sengata, that was a, an amazingly well done presentation. We are so pleased that you've put forward all these excellent um, description and analysis of international law and international legal standards. Um, clearly, uh, the situation for girls who, who have found themselves to be abducted, their plight must be featured internationally and we're so grateful that you're working with your counterparts such as the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and other counterparts within the United Nations mechanisms to take up their plight and to ensure that they are, are not left vulnerable and that eventually countries will, we need to put and we have to continue to put pressure on countries to bring to the local level uh, efforts to stop forced marriage, forced conversions, and um, to end the vulnerabilities that and insecurities that the girls at these levels have. So thank you for bringing it to uh, the local level and to working with countries where communities are continuing to um, uh, hopefully be educated. We, we want to make sure that no one is left behind and we appreciate your presentation today. We look forward to cooperating with you uh, in the future as we feature these issues. So uh, thank you for your time today. I'm aware that you have another engagement to attend to, uh, and we appreciate and are grateful for your participation in our event. Thank you so much. And uh, um, yeah, we, 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 we're grateful. Uh, we're, we're pleased to have Mangla Sharma Mangla Sharma is a member of the Pakistan Hindu Council and has been a member of the Provincial Assembly of Sindh Province in Pakistan since August 2018. She founded Pak Hindu Welfare Association, which focuses on labor and social rights for minorities. She's been nominated as a member of the Provincial Commission on the Status of Women and works closely with Inclusive Security a U.S. nonprofit founded by Ambassador Swanee Hunt. Ms. Sharma is also the recipient of the Fatima Jina Award with the Ministry of Women's Development in Pakistan. Additionally, Ms. Sharma acts as the Vice Chairperson of the International Committee for Peace and Harmony, an organization working towards interfaith fellowship. Ms. Sharma, we would give you the floor. You're welcome. And we know that once you're completed your statement, you'll be leaving us due to the fact you're, you're feeling quite ill uh, because of COVID-19. But please um, give us your presentation now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to say thank you for the Jubilee campaign and the United Nations Council for organizing a, <clears throat> such a very important issue conference. I would like to say that at the time of independence, Pakistan uh, is a total population for the minorities is 23% for the total uh, population of the Pakistan. And it decreases uh, after uh, uh, birds, after decades uh, because the minorities are feel the uh, insecure, but it is not uh, in the uh, uh, overnight. But there were the multiple incidents over the year that they resulted that the exports of the minorities to the other countries, especially to the Western countries. The foremost the cause of the migration of the minorities were in the 1965 and the 1971 war. In after the 1965 war, the most many people of the uh, minorities uh, migrated to the India, and in 1965, 60, 1971 war, the a big part of the uh, Pakistan, the East Pakistan has become a part of the Bangladesh. So the minority migrated to the, the um, in the Bangladesh. According in uh, 2017 census, the minority population is 3.53 percent. 
which is 0.19 percent less than the recorded in the 1998 census it means the uh, population of the minorities gradually decrease and so decrease in the last few decades there were as a incident which have the uh, made the minorities insecure because the <clears throat> forced marriages of the minority communities with the girls are, is a very young age to the muslim boy among the incident with the uh, minority feels of so uh, very insecure <clears throat> which makes them the insecure generally speaking the the minorities not the face the so uh, serious uh, uh, problems here because there is there is a job quota uh, in government jobs they as well as as well as they uh, as well as they uh, compete on the open merit and also they uh, merit on the success the minorities have played a positive role i am myself myself the example of this because i am a, a minority women but i am elected on the muslim journal seat and uh, people are oblige me and give me the <coughs> equal opportunity in the provincial assembly of the sel as the religious extremism has gained the momentum across the globe so has the pakistan been affected by the uh, its uh, uh, serious issues there is the religious extremism uh comes uh, and uh, they are the minority uh, females uh, girls especially girls in the young age uh, they involve with them and they uh, pull out to, to take and uh, uh, give the marriage it's a very serious issue and uh, we all the minorities rather than the christians rather than the hindus they are we are feel the very insecure especially uh, in uh, sin the uh, hindu community and in Punj uh, punjab the christian community but christian community is another problem this is the blasphemy law but uh, forced marriages is the main issue for the hindu community the <coughs> the encouraging news is that the state has the timely response now and uh, <coughs> it issue as the sub the uprising through the military operation is affected if the now if the uh, for any girl has adapted then the uh, state or Uh, uh administration and the judiciary everyone take the prominent action and the environment is uh, less some some good for us but uh, we can't say that there are the very good uh, conditions for us the encouraging news is the uh, at the state level the legislation has been come on to formulate in 2013 sin assembly pass a a uh, law regarding the minorities that the hindu marriage bill and uh, it's a uh, first time in the history of pakistan the uh, marriages for the non muslims are registered before that is the no any data the how much the marriages are registered for the uh, non muslims and uh, <coughs> it's a grand uh, landmark uh, bill and uh, in Uh, again in 19 to uh, 2013 uh, early child marriage extend act also passed by the sin uh, assembly and a unanimous passed by the all the parties it uh, seems that the forced conversion is stop is there any uh, some level but uh, <coughs> people are not scared as because the insecure they were how they were issued to get the fully resolved because within the pakistan there is still exist the uh, some extremist persons when a girl is come out from the uh, home it's a major thing is then when she appears to the court then on that time the mindset of the judge is depend and uh, sometimes all uh, decision uh, change because the my according to the islam the uh, age of uh, a marriage is of a girl is it due to the puberty but uh, we can prove that the we all the if, if uh, we have not uh, again the nic card driving license vote rights nothing is before the 18 years so how can we can we go give that uh, <coughs> we gave up a chance here to marry it's a very uh, it's a large decision how can you do uh, means go and marry with the other person and when uh, the, the girl is 
go there, appear before the court. Sometimes court uh, decide that, uh, so, okay, you can go with your husband. So it's uh, difficult for us, but uh, so now last year, just the Arzu Raja case, it's a grand landmark decision by the court and uh, they refused because the girl was just uh, only 13 years and uh, a guy that is married is uh, 44 years. But uh, now in uh, judge uh, gave the decision and uh, uh, returned back the uh, Arzu with the parents. So it's a, a good thing, but uh, uh, the main thing that can be secure, uh, in feel insecure, it's this that uh, when a, a girl come out and marry with a, a guy, she cut off with all the family, with the community, with the everyone. And most of the time when she appear and convert in Islam, then nobody, other family member of the uh, boys too. Some other person was the witness and marry with him. So in, in that case, the what the security, that the financial security is the social security of the girl, because the many of the in the many cases, after one or two years or three years, they are a dispute and uh, uh, they get divorced, and then the uh, girl is uh, uh, never to go there. And sometimes we it's a fact that the uh, human trafficking is occur because the, they cut off all the community, all the family, uh, nobody knows the who where he, she is. And when uh, the human trafficking, they uh, go is in the prostitutions. So it's a very uh, difficult for us, but uh, uh, in 19, the other time, National Assembly also uh, bills is process regarding the minorities, but uh, uh, it's a problem is there. The extremist uh, uh, elements is uh, more powerful. And uh, when we, uh, uh, I personally, I feel, and the, I uh, solved the so many cases, but uh, personally, I feel when I, uh, we uh, will keep the, these cases in the low profile, no on social media, no on media, no any other thing, then the sometimes we success in our company and we go come back the girls. But uh, if the hype is created in the social media, in the other national or the international media, then the other side, the other extremist groups are come and pressure on the police, the judiciary, everywhere. And in, after in front of them, everyone is the stopped. And uh, at the last day, we are not uh, uh, success in our uh, <coughs> our uh, uh, recovery. Religion has, excuse me. As of the now, the protection bill has been the president and the assembly and the deliberations on the Bilarian process. Religious uh, religion has been used as a key element of the forced conversion. Although in reality, the causes made the together to be the different. Among these causes, the foremost is the poverty. In most cases, it has come to light that the young girls for the poor families are loaned into the converting to Islam. The girl are married or for the Muslim men and stay with them for some time before they are trafficked off to the destination unknown. Most of these girls are the divorced after the sometimes of their lives and made <coughs> miserable. Since they had left their families and their religion, so their ties to their past are broken and they are the under, <coughs> understand helpless and the alone. The government has made the laws that support the rights of the minorities, but what lacks it is awareness of the rights, advocacy on the issue, and above all the capacity among the majority groups of the push for the issues by the face. The need of the hour is to build the capacity of the affected communities to aware the rights and these uh, <coughs> raise their voices whenever they feel violated or the insecure. Other thing is that the, there is no any proper data uh, for the how much the uh, uh, girls are convert, how much they are uh, passing their happy married life, they converted, they trafficking, they are uh, divorced, no any uh, official data. And being a minority, we are not uh, able to do this because the we are afraid that if we are doing this thing that they, we are the in uh, front in the eyes of the religious extremist and uh, it's a uh, very difficult for us so it's my suggestion if uh, I, on the international level uh, it's a 
any uh, campaign or survey there's the how much the uh, uh, girls are converted is a survey other thing is the anything thing this the security of a, a girl uh, see the girl is when nothing no said no financial no social no because it's just the only one the girl and other side there's all the uh, other community so it's a uh, uh, I think uh, it's uh, impossible, it's uh, necessary to take the awareness and other thing is that the, we have no any other our religious uh, uh, schools or other the places where the, we teach our religion because the in our uh, education system, school, colleges, in every subject is only the Islamic uh, uh, heroes, Islamic laws, everything is Islam. And when a child is stay, studied in school and around the, all the Muslim girls and they uh, know everything in the one religion and they feel that the, we are the superior and the other person, uh, child is sit with us with the other religion, we are the minority, is not, uh, uh, is, uh, we are the superior, he is not. So it's uh, inferiority complex is also, and when sometimes pressure, sometimes some uh, greed, they convert them. I they uh, feel that the if a, a Muslim a girl is convert, then the two benefits. One benefit is that the uh, they uh, they uh, got a jannah. In Jannat, they, they, they go in the Jannat, okay. it's a main thing. And the other is the sometimes they uh, are trafficking. They, uh, some cases in uh, when the girl is gone, then the family uh, talked with this uh, then guy and we uh, go uh, and we uh, gave the uh, millions of rupees. Then the millions of rupees, then uh, <coughs> the, the millions of rupees, then to take out the children. So some people are poor, then take out the girl, and when we go, go give the money, then give back for the home. That's uh, it's a main problem. So thank you very much again. Thank you so much, uh, Assemblywoman Sharma, for your outstanding presentation. We really appreciate your uh, participation with us today and understand that due to COVID-19 symptoms, you'll be leaving us. Uh, but we thank you for shining a light on the vulnerability and insecurity that minority girls, Hindus and Christian girls in Pakistan are facing. You've explained to us the, the tragedy of human trafficking that's taking place there, including the cutting off of families and other support mechanisms causing the vulnerable girls to have such insecurity. We thank you for that. And uh, we agree with you that capacity building is needed uh, to try to protect girls, educate them, educate their families, and provide uh, effective opportunities for them to uh, thwart efforts at human trafficking. And uh, we also thank you for describing the legislative initiatives taken in Sindh province and elsewhere in Pakistan. And these are models that perhaps other countries could also consider and take up. Um, so again, thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker, who will be providing her remarks via a pre-recorded video, uh, Ms. Fatima Nagutu, she's a lawyer and advocacy director of Stephanus Foundation, which is based in Abuja, Nigeria. Um, due to the internet connectivity issues, we pre-recorded this event. However, um, she is uh, with us on the panel and she'll be looking forward to answering questions on the panel. Stephanus Foundation is a human rights advocacy, relief, rehabilitation, and reconstruction organization uh, that works to help victims of aggression and those suffering discrimination simply for being Christian in Nigeria by providing intelligence gathering, leadership training, trauma healing, and services for internally displaced people in various camps, IDP camps that have emerged in the last five years or so uh, in Nigeria. Stephanus Foundation creates awareness, both locally and internationally, on persecution of Christians that's taking place in the Northeast of Nigeria, and it, Stephanus Foundation networks with other organizations such as the Christian Association of Nigeria 
and other Christian ministries in Nigeria. Fatima will be sharing about her work for rural women in combating forced conversions and abductions. Um, again, she is present with us today, and uh, but right now her remarks uh, that we'll be sharing have been pre-recorded. Thank you. So talking about forced abductions and conversions in Nigeria, it's become something that's been very prevalent, something that is no longer very shocking news, something that people hear about and ask, oh, who has this happened to this time around and all that, which is not, it's not good for a democracy is not good in the 21st century. The, the, the story of the abduction of the girls from Chibok has become a very, I think it's global news, something that everybody got to hear about. Now that's one story about something that has been happening for a very long time, unreported, many times being denied and all that. But with the Chibok, Chibok, Chibok abduction, it made it very clear. It's now a fact that these things are happening in Northern Nigeria, particularly with the abduction of teenage girls, conversion by force, and then marrying them off without the consent of their parents. You know, in Nigeria, we have the constitution that is the ground norm, which ought to regulate all persons and authorities in this country. But then with the, with the adoption of Sharia law, Sharia cr criminal law, because Sharia personal law had always been one of the laws in our constitution, guiding succession, inheritance, marriage, and stuff like that for, Ni for Nigerian Muslims. But with the adoption of the criminal aspects of Sharia law, it brought in a conflict where it, it appears that for the Muslims, they have two laws to choose from, while for the Christians, they have just one law that they're governed by. Now, talking about the conversions and abductions, we have the freedom of religion of belief enshrined in our constitution. You can choose to believe, you can choose to change your belief, and you can also choose not to believe. That's constitutional. But then in Northern Nigeria, we find out that our girls, girls, Christian girls are abducted. They are converted forcefully, and they are married off without the consent of their parents. The, the um, story of Habiba Ishaku also was very popular in Nigeria at some point, she, because the girl came from Katina State the same state with the president, the current president of Nigeria. When she was abducted, her father cried out. They left her at home only to come back and they didn't find her. The last her, daughter, her elder sister remembered was that she was cooking. They, after much search, it was discovered that someone from the neighborhood had abducted her. And then they had to go through, because we have in the North different kinds of local chiefs and all that. You have the Hakimi and all those things. So, he went through all that me and Gwai, Hakimi and all through the process until it ended at the Emias Palace. The father of the girl went to the Emias Palace where he was told categorically that his daughter has been converted and she was going to be married off and he had no business with her anymore. Now, this is something that is not, it ought not to be so because though we have the Child Rights Act, which is domesticated by, I think 25 states in Nigeria now, 11 states have refused to adopt that um, um, Child Rights Act. One of the reasons, of course, is religion. Now, these are part of the conflict we are talking about because the Child Rights Act put the age of the child at 18. Now for Sharia, you can give birth to a child as long as the child, I mean, you can get married to a, a girl so long as she has reached puberty. So now, in a situation where a Christian girl has been abducted, and converted without her father's consent and told to his face that he cannot have access to his child anymore, you begin to wonder what options does such a parent have? As an advocacy organization, we wrote to the Inspector General of Police, we wrote to the Human Rights Commission, we wrote to a, a, a couple of um, authorities that are corporate in this situation to do something about this situation, but nothing was done. The girl, as I speak to you, how many years after, is still there with the person who abducted her. And I mean, in Nigeria, if we say religion, as per Sharia law, allows that a child can be married at puberty. But then contractual laws, a child that is not yet 18 cannot have a license to drive, for example, cannot enter into binding contracts. Why should it now be that such a child can be allowed to take such 
you know, very serious decisions as conversion, changing religion, and marriage without the consent of the parents. We find this very, very inappropriate in, our, in the circumstances. And so right now, what we're thinking is that there's a need for not just local advocacy, but international advocacy to bring these things to the fore, to continue to discuss about these issues because girls that are abducted, on the age girls especially, who are forced to marry, they face a lot of disadvantages. For example, the VVF is something that has become very common. You see, they get married at young ages where their bodies are not yet ready to give birth. And in the process of childbirth, they develop VVF. And then because of the, the, the smell and all the um, things, the evil, the ills associated with VVF, you find that such girls are abandoned by their husbands, you know, and they move on. And most times these men have the option of marrying other wives. Now these girls are left to no future, except some people out of charity take up these girls and, you know, bear the cost of the very expensive medical, you know, bills and all. And then another thing is that their education sometimes is truncated. When children are married at early ages like that, their education automatically stops. Some are very lucky that their husbands are able to, you know, sponsor them to school, but that's not the case most of the time. And so we, another thing we found out is that most of these abductions and forceful conversions happen to rural girls, girls in rural areas mostly. It's not limited to them, but it's prevalent in the, the rural areas. For the example, the Chibok abduction, Chibok is a rural part you know, of Borno State. And so we're hoping that 11 states in Nigeria that have refused to adopt the um, Child Rights Act will do so, so that girls are protected. Talking about religion, another thing about this that we also need to be looking at and talking more is that when you decide that a child at 13 can convert, and then that same child cannot enter into binding contracts, we need to look at it again. What are we saying? Are we elevating one thing above the other? I think the law should be equal. Everybody should be equal before the law and not looking at what region does this person come from. This law applies to this person because he comes from this part of the country. If it's a United Nation, I mean a United country, a federal country and all that, and we have laws that we feel regulate every one of us, then it should apply to us equally. Subjecting parents to the trauma of raising girls that at the end of the day, someone comes from nowhere and just picks the child away and truncates all the plans and all the investments such parents have had on such children. It's unfair, in the, to, to say the very least of it, it's unfair. And I think these are things that we should continue to discuss and see ways of resolving. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima, for your bold presentation. It's so important that you have given us this information of what's taking place in Nigeria. The fact that there are 11 northern states that have declined to pass the Child Rights Act when the rest of the states have done so in Nigeria is really appalling, particularly since these are the 11 states where most of the forced abductions uh, forced marriages and forced conversions are taking place. Thank you for informing us about this. There's definitely a need for international advocacy to complement the local and state advocacy that's taking place in Nigeria and which you and your organization has been so effectively uh, undertaking. So we appreciate all of the work that you've been doing. And finally, these are heartbreaking descriptions of what happens to girls after they've been abducted, after they've been abused, after uh, they've suffered greatly uh, with diseases and impacts of their bodies being unprepared for marriage and, and childbirth, and then they're literally cast aside. Oh my gosh, that is heartbreaking. Thank you for telling us about this. It reminds us that we need to continue to try to support the rehabilitation of those kinds of, of girls that are, are impacted in those kinds of ways so that they can have their lives restored. Thank you for that. Our final speaker today is Gada Melek. 
Ms. Malik is a political advisor and social activist uh, and has lived in Canada for over 30 years after fleeing Egypt as a teenager with her parents and she fled in order to escape persecution. Since 2014, Gada has been actively involved in Canadian politics and has run for elections at various levels of the government. In 2018, she joined the board of directors of Coptic Solidarity, a global organization advocating for equal rights of cops in Egypt. And this organization has released a, a report, Jihad of the Womb, Trafficking of Coptic Women and Girls in Egypt. It's one of the reports that uh, caused our organization to want to put forward um, this important event today. Uh, the report addresses the widespread practice of abductions and trafficking of Coptic women and girls in Egypt and how they are particularly vulnerable uh, group to exploitation. And um, certainly this is a group that needs attention in Egypt. So we are grateful that Gada Melek can join us today. And at this time, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you, Anne. Thank you for having me. Um, as uh, many know, trafficking rings uh, in Egypt targeting Coptic women began in the 70s, but have now reached an all-time high. In the last decade alone and following the Arab Spring, there have been about 500 cases of trafficking of Coptic women and girls. Uh, the report Coptic Solidarity published is a groundbreaking report. It came out at, uh, September, in September 2020, uh, titled Jihad of the Womb, Trafficking of Coptic Women and Girls in Egypt. Uh, the report addressed the widespread practice of targeting the vul this vulnerable group uh, to exploitation. International attention to the issue of traffic trafficking Coptic women is civic and significantly lacking. And this lack of attention can be attributed to a number of reasons. Firstly, there's the difficulty in documenting many of these cases due to the sensitivity of the matter in the society where honor culture is prevalent. Uh, secondly, is the risk faced by human rights advocates and family and friends. Since reporting to the international community is typically frowned upon in Egypt. And uh, lastly, the excuse used by the Egyptian government officials that the girls and women have gone willingly or that they have eloped based on a romantic relationship. Both the Egyptian law number 64 of 2010 on human rights, on human trafficking, and the UN amendment to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000, both highlight that consent is irrelevant if done under conditions of coercion, abduction, fraud, deception, etc., which is the case in many of these situations. So in using this excuse, the Egyptian government is denying them the right to dignity, well-being, and legal protection under the law. There's ample evidence pointing to organized networks related to selfist groups who are actively engaging in the phenomena we call jihad of the womb. This strategy focuses on seizing infidel women and seeding them with Muslim babies, thereby depleting the numbers on one side and shifting them to the other. A former member of these groups explained that these kidnappers meet in a mosque to discuss potential victims. They keep a close eye on Christian houses and monitor every move to the, of the girls. On that basis, they weave a spider's web around them. Some of the tactics they use include utilizing or planting a Muslim female neighbor, colleague, coworker, or a friend to invite the Coptic woman to their home and then go out uh, anywhere where they can be forcibly kidnapped. <clears throat> or another tactic involves luring the girls through a romantic relationship using a Romeo pimp who would then convince her to elope with the promise of building a new life. Many of these girls wouldn't end up marrying their captor, but another person uh, in a bait and switch tactic. The former member of the kidnapping ring also stated that this group rented apartments in different areas of Egypt to hide kidnapped Coptic girls, where they put them under pressure or take the compromising pictures or videos of them, then threaten them if they don't convert to Islam, they would defame them and their families. 
Once the girls reach the legal aid, a specially arranged Islamic representative comes in to make the convention, to the conversion official, issue a certificate and accordingly change their ID and thereby also change their religion. Obviously an Egyptian uh, ID lists a person's religion and once that is done, there is no reversing it. It's very important also to highlight that these networks are often supported by like-minded high-ranking officials in the police, national security, and the local administration. They play various roles, like refusing to lodge official complaints by the victims' families, or falsifying the police investigations, or arranging for formal sessions for, of conversion to Islam and Al-Azhar. And finally, uh, they also harass the families into silence and acceptance of the de facto trafficking of their loved ones. And it's very tragic because most of these women don't end up ever re reuniting with their families, but they continue to live in a perpetual nightmare of modern day slavery. The perpetrators are never brought to justice. Even if the family knows who they are or mention their names to the police, the names are typically, there's a big resistance to putting the name in the report. The police often know the details, but they lie and mislead the family in an effort to make them give up hope and let the girls go. Coptic Solidarity has a number of recommendations, uh, obviously knowing that public pressure, uh, and accountability is effective in return, returning the girls, but also ending impute, impunity. So some of our recommendations focus on asking the UN and the different states to identify avenues for accountability. There are joint projects focused on combating human trafficking in Egypt with the UK and the EU. These projects should ensure that the priority is placed on Coptic women as the most vulnerable and most targeted group. The 2021 Egypt chapter of the U.S. State Department's annual trafficking in persons report should include particular information on the targeting of Coptic women and consult with the State Department's Office of International Religious Freedoms to ensure accurate information. Currently, the 2020 report doesn't include that. There could also be a creation of a legal defense fund to help Coptic families in need of an attorney. We can also assist the Egyptian government with building and, uh, and staffing shelters for trafficking victims, which is currently a lacking thing, and there's no service to help these people cope or rehabilitate. And finally, to assist the Egyptian government in educating and the, the security and judicial and relevant government officials, uh, because many of them continue to arrest and charge trafficking victims with prostitution. I, I would uh, end my presentation here, but uh, I could uh, give uh, one example if there is enough time. Yes, please give your example. Okay, uh, so one personal story is Hanan Adli Gerges. The, the report lists about 13 out of the 500 cases, but Hanan's story has all the elements of the impunity, of the deceit, of the police refusing to cooperate and so on. So Hanan was 18 years old when she was kidnapped on January 27, 26, 2017. She was taken from her home in Esna village. She was in her room alone, despite there were other women present in the house, and she was found missing at 3 a.m. when her brothers returned from the field. Hanan's family accused their neighbor, Muhammad Suleiman, of kidnapping her. Police questioned Muhammad, and he admitted that he had a connection to the kidnapping, but he was released due to minimal physical evidence. A few days later, it was discovered that Hanan was issued a new ID card, which can only be done by the Egyptian government. Anand's new ID card listed her religion as a Muslim instead of Christian, forcibly converting her to Islam. Anand's family and other villagers protested at the police station peacefully, but they were attacked and injured by police officers. 
There have been no updates about Hanan, and there have been no attempts to recover her or trace her new identity. Thank you wow. for giving me the opportunity uh, to share Hanan's story. Wow. That is definitely a story illustrative of what you were telling us about the statistics. It's important that we go beyond statistics and see the, the actual individual that has suffered. And it's their story. We, we must stand to ensure that they're not forgotten. As you mentioned in your presentation, if we stand with the families, uh, hopefully they will not uh, lose heart and become hopeless. Um, somehow we are always hoping that they will be reunited with uh, the girls that have been abducted. Um, again, we thank you for your so, so, uh, sobering statistics and stories that motivate all of us to see these patterns of exploitation and abuse and to try to end them. And all of our panelists today have given us very illustrative examples, but have also given us very sobering statistics. And uh, again, we appreciate and are grateful for the special rapporteur on exploitation of children and girls, and particularly uh, the international legal framework in which all countries could actually put a stop to this. And we've heard today from Sin province where legislation has been introduced. We've heard today from uh, within, um, uh, you know, Nigeria, the majority of states have actually uh, passed the Child Protection Act, but then one, uh, 11 states in the north of Nigeria where the situation's at its worst, they declined to look at the, the, the Child Rights Act in Nigeria. And these are issues that we as the international community need to take up and to end. Um, at this time, we're going to turn to question and answer. We have quite a number of questions. Um, if panelists are able to stay on, uh, we encourage that uh, as there are specific questions that maybe you'll be able to shed light on. The first question I'd like to uh, um, read here is actually anonymously given, but it's a very good question. Uh, this uh, questioner writes, one of the reasons given by states and police authorities for not acting is that the girls allegedly consented to the marriage or wanted it. Does this excuse hold up as a reason to not hold perpetrators accountable? Um, I would like for our panelists to address that. Um, what should be done, particularly when it's alleged that the girls wanted this? I certainly know that that's an issue that occurs with the girls in Egypt. Perhaps we could start with um, uh, with Gada answering that question. Oh, thank you, Anne. So uh, typically, um, there used to be a, a practice of allowing the girls to meet with their families and uh, basically to uh, see that examine whether this conversion was actually sincere. Uh, although I, at a minor age, this should not even be the case. Um, but at the minimum, there should be uh, some opportunity for, for the girls to meet with their families, to meet with maybe a panel, to be interviewed by a panel of independent-minded uh, people. Uh, that, that's for a minimum. Uh, also, the idea of depending on the age, obviously, because we, we have this uh, age between 18 and 21 where this is a gray area. Girls are considered minors and they cannot make a decision without, uh, without their parents. But as, once they've converted, now they can make all these life changing decisions. Um, but in general, like I mentioned, the laws uh, in Egyptian laws, as well as the UN uh, declarations, they're all mentioning that if the decision of conversion or marriage is made under coercion, deceit, or, or even just eloping with a boyfriend and running away and getting, thinking that you're going to get married to him, obviously you get married to someone else by force. That's what we are witnessing. Uh, this is a crime. This is uh, to be designated under human trafficking and has no other name. 
Excellent. Fatima, would you also uh, provide us your observation as it relates to what if, what if they say the girls invited this, wanted this, consented to this? Um, is that true? Um, yeah, um, for me, I think the question would be, do they have that the girls, have they actually the girls' time and consent? Would it be lawful to say that the 13 year old or a 9 year old is driving a car because she consented to it? Would it be a justification that the child, you know, don't commit a crime and then the child is very good simply because consented to it? I think it's a common sense question, you know. If people do not just like to justify criminality, it, would not, it does not make sense to simply say that a child consented to something that she's not legally capable to do. So in my opinion and my view, I don't think that the, ch the children have attained the age to even consent. Because if, if, if that was the case, then there would be no need for a guardian, for example, to be needed for a child to pay the It means that a child can go to a shop and buy things and just, you know, enter into any kind of contract without anybody asking for for I mean, the guardian consent and things like that. Why do you say men when it comes to marriage? They say the child consent. Child also consent to other things that legally the child cannot do. And we require adults to sign for them, consent for them. Um, thanks for, for your comments on that. I have uh, put forward a specific question to Assemblywoman Sharma. I'm not sure if she's still with us. She indicated um, that she would use her audio to respond to questions. If uh, Congresswoman Sharma is still with us, the question is, the Prime Minister of Pakistan ordered an investigation into the forced conversion and marriage of religious minorities. What effects has this action had, if any, and what recommendations would you make to other countries dealing with similar, similar issues uh, and whether um, investigations can be pushed forward by the heads of states? Uh, Ms. Sharma has, has left the, the panel. She so, has left. Okay. Yeah, but I will send it to her so that she can respond via email and then we'll share it with the participants here today. All right. Thank you so much. So. Um, it is true that from time to time, heads of states actually provide um, investigations and use their authorities. And I think that that's one tool that all of us um, advocates can get behind and push. And we also need to push the authorities to actually engage in um, using tools such as investigations and um, I wanted to to ask um, Gada, you mentioned the complicity of the police. So when there is the complicity of the police, what would you propose that could be done to hold them re responsible for their falsehoods, their false investigations, their false reports? Do you have any recommendations pertaining to ending the complicity by police and authorities? I believe that uh, until a, a light is shine on the complicity and on the impunity, nothing will change. And this is exactly where this forum and similar opportunities where partners from either the EU or the UK or whoever, like we were talking about projects that are joint projects that are the opportunities to hold uh, the government accountable. If the government feels the pressure, uh, they would uh, investigate. There, there would be, um, you know, a different way of handling this same perpetrators. Most of the times it's repeat, um, these issues happen in particular regions, for example, more than others in the country, because there has been established these uh, organized networks and those uh, cooperating high-ranking officers or officials. 
I think, as you're saying, accountability is so vitally important. And if we hold our elected officials responsible, we must push them that they would then hold police and investigating authorities responsible. Fatima, do you have issues in Nigeria with complicity by police or local authorities? And if so, do you have any recommendations that could be made to push and uh, pressurize them to also uh, change their conduct and, and comply with laws to protect the vulnerable? Well, in Nigeria, So this was it's one of the conflicts when it comes to this kind of instances. I usually not very I can't hear you, can you hear me? Hello. So so one of the reasons we pre-recorded Fatima Nujuku's remarks is because there's always internet challenges um, uh, and and uh, internet is, is not uh, working, it appears, with Nigeria. So we, uh, we may not be able to hear from her clearly. Um, so at this point, um, I wanted to highlight um, one of the questions in the question box is from Marina Mikel. Uh, she's with Mott for Peace, Development, and Human Rights. Her question is, where can she get statistics on the number of forced marriage cases and conversions of women and girls? Do countries provide statistics like this? It's a great question. It's been my observation that countries themselves tend not to. And that's another way that advocacy organizations can get involved is to try to get your governments to actually um, make reports, count the numbers of victims, count the uh, efforts that that um, are being made, quantify it in some way. So that way there can be accountability. Um, with that said, the UN Special Rapporteur does provide annual reports. The Special Rapp Rapporteur that we've heard from today uh, has presented a number of reports. These can be found on the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on their website. And we encourage you to uh, reach out and to find those reports because indeed these are reports that the United Nations Special Rapporteur has uh, prepared and they would have uh, excellent information. Um, but from a country standpoint, normally it's NGOs, non-governmental organizations and community organizations that actually put forward the specific reports, if any. And if they don't exist, uh, we obviously encourage local organizations to take that up and try to gather the information. One way that we have seen uh, that this can take place is joining perhaps with a university. There's many uh, colleges and universities where there's uh, research um, and development uh, avenues where uh, numbers and reports could be generated. Um, and so we would encourage those kind of partnerships with universities to try to gather the data because with the data, there'd be a better way to change policy. One of the impacts on policy obviously is to have data generated and data driven policy decisions and that, of course, takes people gathering the data. Um, we have a question from John or Jan Hanna. Um, how can one find hope for the improvement of this horror, knowing that laws and international declarations are decades old, yet the problem persists? So once again, I'd like to point out, yes, the problem persists, but oftentimes the conventions, international uh, standards, are in place, such as the Convention on the Rights of a Child, um, these have to be implemented at the local state level. International agreements are only as good as the enforcement that takes place within the states. 
most states um, have taken actions to adopt legislation and when that happens then then you have to actually uh, encourage the implementation of those of the legislation that's that's actually put into place so I think that this uh, this has to be done at a at a local community level where efforts are made and I think that that's where capacity building comes in and it's very important to generate capacity building for people in their local communities to be able to take up these causes and to to change local implementation of laws. Um, another question from Julia Becknell. One girl I know, she wrote, uh, that I know of, her family lived on the campus of a well-known Amuda Bello University in Zaria, Kaduna State, one of the top educational institutions in Africa. What pressure can say the international education institutes exert where the perpetrator is known, uh, such as in that environment? That's an excellent question. I'd, I'd love to have Fatima answer, but I don't believe she's with us. Um, is is it possible to have her audio on to answer this question? No, it appears she's not with us. So, um, so Julia, I, I don't know that we can have uh, an answer from within Nigeria. I apologize for that. Um, that's again why we pre-recorded her remarks because we often have challenges with internet connectivity uh, with Nigeria. So um, there are additional questions here and um, there's one from Kamal Fami. The kidnapping of minority women seems systematic in countries of Islamic majority. It seems there is not only a smoking gun but coupling of that of millions of victims. What are the steps taken by the UN and international community doing to, to stop this? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I think that once again, the international community needs data and information. Um, there is at the UN level, and I appreciate again, the special rapporteur on the exploitation of children and girls, her presentation to us, uh, by the the honorable um, uh, was was excellent and she 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 demonstrated that there is collaboration uh, with those um, who are basically tasked by the UN to present reports but they need data they need information <coughs> and they definitely need our inputs so once again we encourage that inputs are made and that uh, efforts are made along that line. Um, so at this point, I just wanted to um, conclude um, our event and mention that the efforts that we've been trying to show um, can be done. Oftentimes the tools are in place, but the efforts that can be done need to be done uh, at the local level, but also through international advocacy. So what we're looking at um, is that there are trends and patterns. These trends and patterns are often provided by, uh, uh, I mean, uh, dem, um, they're actually written up in international reports presented by the UN Special Rapporteurs and UN functions. And um, these reports are important, need to be featured and highlighted, which is one reason for why we've done the event today. What makes religious minority women and girls targets of forced marriages is often, as we heard today, um, a community issue, it's a religious issue. There are multiple layers that impact um, those that are most vulnerable and suffering from insecurity. And so we definitely need to have um, a concerted effort with all uh, partners cooperating to prevent any future incidents from happening. Um, and so it's our goal today that we would highlight that uh, religious freedom advocacy is one avenue to, to end at least 
um, in certain countries, the forced abduction and forced um, uh, marriages and then conversion of girls. We are thankful for the Special Rapporteur's reference that, this, that um, also the UN has focused on that from the Office of the Special Rapporteur on the Freedom of Religion and Conscience. It's clear that uh, these efforts need to continue and we need to continue to, to highlight, bolster, and feature them. Um, so um, it is our, our, our desire that we can push out this video for those who are with us, uh, still with us on, on the panel uh, and uh, who are observing this event, we, it would be great once we put out the video that you could make sure that the video, that you tweet about it, Facebook about it, at least push out the video because there's very inf important information and data that's featured here. And we would encourage everyone to participate in getting the word out about um, the efforts that we're making today to put an end to uh, the essentially the impunity that um, the vulnerable are suffering from. We want to make sure that no child is left behind. We want to be sure that the international community maintains and keeps a focus. Again, thank you all for your participation today, uh, for attending this event, and we look forward to ongoing dialogue and discussion as we uh, make sure that the international community remembers these girls, especially on Monday, the, the International Day for Women. Thank you all.